Hello and welcome. We're coming to you live from the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics in Madison, Wisconsin. Today we will be telling you about UW's heart attack program and the critical heart care patients receive here after a heart attack. I'm Dr. Richard Page. I'm a cardiologist and chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, and I'll be your host for today's program. Joining me is Dr. Amish Raval, who is also a cardiologist and director of our Level 1 Heart Attack Program, and Dr. Ryan Wubin, who is a medical director for UW Med Flight and an emergency medical physician. Last but not least is Brenda Larson, who is the chest pain coordinator for UW Hospital and Clinics. In just a moment, we'll be showing you video of an actual STEMI procedure and our transport team who is responsible for bringing heart patients in critical need to our doors. But first, I want to mention that over the next hour, we will be answering your email questions. If you'd like to send us a question anytime during the program, just click the Ask a Question button on your webcast screen. We welcome your questions, and we'll try to answer all of them. Also, this webcast will be available on demand later this evening. If you'd like to share this program with a colleague, friend, or family, they can access it through this website. Now let's get started. I'd like to ask Dr. Raval to tell you a little bit about our program. Amish? Well, first of all, thanks, Rick. Uh, the uh, STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, you, de you defined it, is a very common problem. It affects about 500,000 Americans in the U.S. every single year. It's a common cause of death. Uh, STEMI can be averted by opening up the blocked artery. But how does that artery get blocked? Well, first of all, you, patients who have this condition have an underlying plaque. Cholesterol buildup, the surface of that plaque uh, erodes and subsequently ruptures, and a clot forms abruptly and suddenly. That then prevents blood supply going down the artery into the heart muscle. And that heart muscle, then being deprived of oxygen and blood supply, starts to die or necrose. And as a result, a variety of complications can happen. The most feared complication, of course, is death. As physicians, as cardiologists, as emergency providers, the first thing we can do, the best thing we can do, is get that artery open fast. We do that, first off, at the patient level. The patient has to recognize their symptoms. We've all heard about this, the classical uh, symptom of chest discomfort, tightening across the chest, the fist on the chest, the heaviness, the oppressive feeling. Some people coin it as an elephant sitting on their chest. Now that's a common symptom and it's co more common in men. Uh, women oftentimes don't have that very classical symptom or description. Uh, sometimes women present with other symptoms, nausea, fatigue, dizziness. There's some a variety of symptoms that women can present with for a variety of reasons that we're not really too sure about, but it's really important that we keep our mind open to that being the diagnosis because the treatment has to happen quickly and efficiently, and that's it's really key. So the patient may experience severe chest pain or maybe even more often in women, this shortness of breath, but this feeling that they are severely unwell, and that's the point where they should seek medical attention. Absolutely, I might also add this also applies to people who have diabetes and the elderly. They may not present with the classical oppressive chest discomfort that we, we, we all know about. Now we're going to be talking about the process of what happens to a patient who's experienced these symptoms. And you've very nicely described what they may feel and the fact that they need to seek attention. We're fortunate to have Dr. Ryan Wubin, who I already in introduced, who's one of our med flight physicians. Ryan, we're going to be showing a video here. Why don't you take us through what's happening in what we see on the video? Thank you, Dr. Page. Uh, MedFlight is one of the oldest uh, helicopter EMS transport services in the United States, first started in 1985. Uh, we are also one of the few programs on this continent that also flies with a physician on all of our flights, and that's gone on since day one. We also have a very highly experienced crew of, of nurses and communication specialists as well that work with us and are standing by 24-7 with one aircraft and we also have a second aircraft that's available 12 hours of the day as well. And we come in when the phone call is made, usually from either outside hospitals where these patients frequently will present uh, outside of our own institution uh, or by EMS through their local county 911 systems as well. And we'll get uh, notified through either one of those two um, 
modalities through the comm center at UW Hospital's MedFlight so Dispatch. So while we're doing this, let's go ahead and take a look at the video and you can tell us what we're seeing. This is one of our aircraft. It's a, a Eurocopter EC-135. It travels about 150 miles an hour. Uh, our typical radius is uh, probably 60 to 80 miles or so if you go from Adams Friendship to Prairie du Chien down to Freeport, Illinois and Rockford and over to Watertown. That's our typical area that we're transporting patients and we have uh, active relationships with all of those hospitals. Frequently, those hospitals will be the first ones that will see these patients. An EKG will be done by the referring physician and they'll call us and we'll check the weather and uh, and make haste to get out there in an efficient but uh, orderly fashion. So what you've just described is you're actually one of the doctors flies out from UW Health to the site where the patient's having a heart attack. So really, they've got an emergency physician and they've got one of our team doctors there on site. Correct. We, uh, this is Dr. Mike Abernathy and uh, Larry, who's one of our flight nurses. They went out and uh, picked up this patient and uh, brought them to UW Hospital. And this is just showing the uh, one of our other physicians as well here, uh, showing the process by which we go out, we pick up the patient with a physician and a nurse, uh, do our evaluation, uh, do the continue the initial therapies that typically have already been started in consultation with Dr. Raval and then or the other cardiologists, and then we bring them back here to University Hospital and bring them down to the cath lab uh, and hand off care, uh, which you're seeing here, which is a, a quick um, but efficient uh, telling of the story of what had happened, uh, how long their symptoms had been present, what has been done, any compl complications that we may have encountered, uh, including uh, uh, atypical heart rhythms or blood pressure issues and so forth. We get the patient quickly and efficiently over from our cot to the cath lab table. So that's the cath lab table right there. They're right there. Into. This is in the cath lab itself. And uh, once we get them over to the uh, cath lab table right there. We hand care off, answer any questions that may have come up. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, sometimes it's actually very complicated in that these patients can sometimes be very sick. Maybe if I can interrupt, you know, at this point in time, what we're trying to do is uh, these are very scared patients. Obviously, they're very uncomfortable, they're having a lot of chest pain, oftentimes, they're shaking. Um, a sense of impending doom. So it's really uh, incumbent upon us to make sure that they understand the procedure that's going to happen to them to calm them down and to um, make sure that the f workflow happens very smoothly, efficiently, but calmly. You just pointed out an important factor. The patient having a heart attack is awake. They're experiencing symptoms, experiencing symptoms, and that's different from sudden cardiac death, sudden cardiac arrest, which occasionally will accompany a heart attack, but most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time these patients are awake and as you said, just terribly frightened, aren't they? Absolutely. Sudden cardiac death really implies a heart abruptly stopping and that can happen for a variety of reasons. A common reason is an arrhythmia. Rick, you're an electric physiologist, an electrician if you will. Uh, one of the causes though is a heart attack of this uh, fibrillation happening and that's what where I come in to try to open up that artery and I'm a plumber and that's what I do. Right and, and that's one of the common misconceptions they hear about someone dying suddenly they say it was a heart attack that may have been a no. primary rhythm but, but sometimes your heart attack patients will also have a life-threatening arrhythmia so they're monitored very closely there. We already have a question and I'd like to pose this to, uh, to Dr. Raval yeah. What's, what's the first thing you do for someone experiencing a heart attack? I think this is from the perspective of patients having pain. Maybe they're on the way to the emergency room or they've called the paramedics. What can a loved one do for someone having a heart attack at that moment? Well, the first thing to do is, you know, again, to call 911. Um, we don't want patients to be running around the house looking for their aspirin or other things. Really, it's 911. Uh, at the scene, the paramedics or EMTs, when they arrive, the standard now is to do a 12-lead electrocardiogram. That is to get a monitored assessment of the heart electrically. That can tell us very crucial information, whether that artery is occluded or not, but also the location of where that artery is blocked. That EKG then gets transmitted to the uh, various physicians and teams so that the whole ball can get rolling to get that patient uh, to the, the, the facility that can open that artery. Uh, and that's what really caused this cascade of events. The patient had chest pain and goes and gets an EKG, an electrocardiogram, and that's really what gets things started. 
This is a condition that's measured in minutes, Rick. This is not something that we kind of take our time thinking about. Uh, we are in a rush to get that artery open. It's kind of like a relay race. The patient develops symptoms. That's the initial baton. Subsequently, the EKG has to be done by the paramedics that arrived at the scene. The inter-hospital or inter-scene to hospital transport occurs. And then finally, when they get the ball and comes in our court in the cardiac cath lab, we have to get that ar artery open quickly. And we can generally do that within about 11 or 12 minutes. But all of the steps that precede that happen to have, have to happen very quickly. Got it. So we're picking up the patient by helicopter, brought the cath lab. Let's go ahead and show the next video demonstrating the beginning of the heart catheterization. So now we've got the patient on the table, and if we can just start the video, uh, we can see that the, uh, uh, the physician is attempting to localize the artery. So what we're seeing here is the groin, kind of the crease between the leg and the abdomen uh, in the groin area. Uh, and that's where an artery called a femoral artery is. And so the uh, physician is introducing a needle. They've already applied some local anesthetic. So this is a very, from the patient's perspective, this doesn't hurt that much. Uh, the uh, artery is uh, uh, cannulated with the needle, and a little guide wire is in, uh, uh, floated into that uh, artery. And then over that little guide wire, a short tube will be inserted shortly. Uh, and that's the port. Here, here we go. Here's this tube going in. And that's the port through which all of our diagnostic catheters and our treatment catheters and our stents and balloons and guide wires and all the rest of it, that's the port of entry of how we get to the heart. So that port's kind of like a straw, isn't it, that, that it allows access directly into the blood vessel? Absolutely. Here we go with a standard diagnostic catheter. And, and let me introduce Dr. Giorgio Gemelli. He's the director of our uh, UW Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, and he's the one who's conducting this procedure. I'll just remind the audience that this is, a live, uh, this is an actual case. Uh, so he's uh, already introduced the catheter, and the first thing we do is we typically uh, inject the artery that we don't think the blockage is, just so that we can understand the lay of the land. There's two arteries, the right and the left, and so we, we pick the, the opposite catheter first, get in a quick, quick assessment of what that artery and looks like. You can like. tell that kind of from the EKG, can't you? We can. With pretty good likelihood, which artery is blocked, and you take a picture of the normal one first? We take a picture of, usually take a picture of the normal one. Many times, though, we'll go straight to the culprit one if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, um, if their blood pressure is low, if their heart rate's very high. Um, at, sometimes we'll just go straight to the culprit. But a lot of times we, we do this where we took, check the opposite artery and see what the lay of the land is. Because the last thing we want to do is mis, uh, mis, um, identify that that opposite artery, the non-culprit artery, is somehow is normal because a lot of times people have plaque buildup in multiple arteries and it's really nice to know that before we go in and fix something. Right. So, so here the, the patient's on the table. It looks like you put in the sheath or the straw that allows you to introduce the heart catheter um, devices and potentially make this heart attack stop occurring. Right. Is that right? So that would be the next step. So we've taken a picture. Now this is a guiding catheter, slightly bigger tube. This is a kind of tube that we use to advance uh, catheters, uh, other catheters through, balloon catheters, guide wires. This is our workhorse, if you will. So now we're taking that larger, slightly larger catheter uh, in, but same, through that same small straw on the leg, and, and we're going to be introducing, and he's going to be introducing that into the, uh, into the artery shortly. Uh, there's a lot of time spent, you know, preparing the, these catheters and making sure there's no bubbles um, and, and making sure we avoid blood loss. I mean, that's a, it's a sort of standard thing. Um, but um, you, as you can see, what I, I want to emphasize here is that uh, this is a, an actual case and uh, the, the operators are very calm in performing this very diligently. That's, that's what I think is impressive here. The, everyone looks so calm, but they are trying to beat the clock. They're trying to to intervene and open up this artery as soon as possible. We have another question, and I'll actually address this to you, Dr. Wubin. Um, and from a fairly sophisticated individual, I think, watching this evening, in the absence of ancillary testing, what role do advanced practitioners have during in-flight pre-hospital care? The, in, a, in a perfect situation, a STEMI will sometimes look deceptively calm in the uh, patient's transport. Uh, much of the work that we do uh, is done at the outside hospital or in the field. One of the things that uh, Dr. Roval mentioned and that is new over the last several years is that we are flying directly to the scene sometimes 
and picking these patients up out in the field at their houses, at their places of work and so forth and bringing them straight back to uh, UW Hospital uh, or wherever they may need to go. Um, a lot of the work is done on the ground, either in the back of an ambulance or in the emergency department at the outside referring hospital. Uh, in the air, we want our flights to be relatively calm. Uh, hopefully, we will have addressed any problems, uh, any rhythm problems, blood pressure issues, if the patient's quite sick, actually, if we need to intubate them, meaning putting a breathing tube down their throat. Much of that work does is done uh, at the uh, outside hospital on the ground. Although all of us who have done this long enough will encounter those situations where even though we may think things are okay, uh, we run into situations where they are not and we have to intervene. So if the patient had a cardiac arrest, you'd be able to shock the heart back into rhythm even while you're traveling 150 miles an hour toward the cath lab Correct. Uh, in the helicopter. Correct. Fantastic. Okay, so Amish, back to you. In terms of the next step, We've seen that the, um, the diagnostic cath was going to be performed. The next step is actually looking at what you would call the culprit vessel and trying to identify what is causing this heart attack. Let's roll the video and have you talk us through that. And then I believe we have another opportunity to look at a side-by-side -side picture of um, before and after a, a heart attack. So here we are, we're advancing that larger tube, this is the guiding catheter, into the opposite artery. In this case, it's the uh, uh, left main corner, the, the left coronary artery. Uh, at, this at this point in time, the uh, guide catheter is placed over, and you should understand this is all done x-ray guided for those of the people in the audience who don't know how these images are being obtained. Uh, this is all done x-ray uh, guided, and, uh, and it's really important to know that the patient's also awake. You know, they're, they're kind of awake, they're kind of sedated uh, with some mild sedatives, but they're able to talk to us and give us some feedback. So just to backtrack, in fact, this is, we're kind of uh, jumped ahead a little bit. This is a, a picture of the right coronary artery, just showing the, the image of the diagnostic image of the right, and we'll get a good chance to see that here. Uh, this is the right coronary artery. This patient actually has an, a curious anomaly. This one of that big, big, big branch that's coming off the horizon there uh, is coming off an unusual origin, but that's okay. It, it looks quite okay. Um, there's some mild calcification there, but nothing, uh, nothing too terrible. Uh, so here we are. This is the non-culprit artery first, and then subsequently we'll be showing the uh, culprit artery. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's really happens very quickly. You know, we, we do this, it's, it seems like on a video, it seems so, 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 so long, but, but you know, in fact, we're, we're working very quickly at, at our end of the table to get these catheters and devices um, ready to go. Um, next, we'll be showing the guiding catheter getting into position. And when we, when we get that guide catheter position, we have to understand that, that, that guide catheter is a bigger device. So we have to be a little bit more careful about where and how we position it. We don't want it to um, rupture the artery or to dissect the artery. Um, and that's uh, you know, part of where experience and uh, doing thousands of these cases uh, comes in. So um, it's a really important point. So, so now you've, you've started to take some pictures. Let's go ahead and roll the next video when it's available of the next steps as you get the, the guide wire from the nurse and start preparing to actually open up this this blood vessel yeah so I think you know as a first step if we can get that uh, video going that would be great the um, the uh, getting the guide the guide wire is a a, a very flimsy wire it's a, a, a 0 0.01 fourteenths of an inch wire um, for these procedures they have kind of floppy tips they're very friendly to the artery uh, they kind of bounce off the normal parts of the artery but have a very uh, good kind of one-to-one -one control tip control so that we can steer the, the uh, guide wire through through the plaque um, these uh, guide wires are, are made of a variety of different compounds uh, but they're high performance wires we have a whole assortment you can see in the, here in the cath lab uh, we're simply looking at the monitor but behind Dr. Jamelli and the team there's a whole uh, cabinet filled with uh, guide wires and catheters, and uh, it's really important for the audience to know that when we do, here, there you go, you can see the guide wires and catheters right there um, in, the, in the background. We have a large assortment uh, because not every patient is the same. So here we are, they're, now they're uh, getting down to injecting the uh, culprit artery, and this is the artery in question. Um, that uh, is suspected to have the STEMI, and again, we know that from the previous EKG. Uh, he's checking the uh, images out uh, to see uh, uh, really what the uh, artery looks like. If we can uh, show the um, 
the image of the uh, the X-ray image of the uh, artery. That would be great. Um, he's a uh, and so this is a side-by-side -side view. Now, this isn't the patient in question right now, but this is kind of to give you an example of what an artery might look like uh, with a STEMI. So here's a, the right coronary artery. Uh, there's a catheter there at the 12 o'clock position, injecting dye, and you'll see an abrupt blockage there. The end of that tip seems a, a, of the blockage seems to be kind of hazy uh, with, not a lot of, with no flow beyond it. And that's on the left side. Um, uh, on the left panel. On the right panel, you can see the artery wide open. This is after a stent is placed. Big dramatic result, huge improvement, and uh, the patient is likely to do well with that kind of yeah, result. Yeah, what a huge difference if you see on the left that artery just blocked off, and you can almost imagine the blood clot sitting there blocking that off, and all the rest of the heart downstream from there just dying right. for blood flow. And then this amazing after picture on, the, on the, uh, the right of the screen demonstrating what happens when, in this case, the blood vessel was opened. We have another question that came through, and it, it brings to mind the expression, time is muscle, and referring to the fact that we want that blood vessel opened as quickly as possible because everything downstream is dying and continues to die over a period of time. And this, this question um, is, uh, is fairly sophisticated, asking, what is the average door to cath time from EMS arrival to hospital to balloon time um, for your system? So basically, what is the door to balloon time for your system? And what is being done pre-hospital for advanced notification at the hospital? For example, uh, getting the ER and everyone ready for the cath lab. As I saw in your earlier video, the patient doesn't even stop through our emergency room, goes straight from the helicopter to the cath lab. But can you tell us a little bit about the door to balloon, what that means, and how we're doing? Great question. Um, so let's just uh, backtrack. You know, the, the concept of door to balloon was borne out by the fact of clinical trials demonstrating that the shorter the door to balloon time, the better the outcome. The optimal window is 60 minutes. It's quite acceptable to be 90 minutes to get that artery open. When you get out to um, 120 or beyond, the outcomes of that patient do they do more, not as well. Uh, so really, the goal is to get that into that golden hour, that one, uh, 60 minute period. Now, our door to balloon time for those patients that arrive to the UW Emergency Department from within the Dane County region, or kind of our local county, uh, that door to balloon time in 2010 was 46 minutes. 46 minutes. So that's just about half what is considered high quality care. High quality care on which we're judged is to have patients have the balloon by 90 minutes. And we're averaging 46. 46 minutes in 2010. And when we look at our regional performance and look, and look at our, the, uh, the sites that where med flights are required and so forth, that number is also well under 90 minutes. Even with a helicopter ride. Even with a helicopter. That's amazing. Well, let's move on to the next video where uh, we're looking at, uh, and you can take us through this, the next step in the heart catheterization, <laughs> advancing the guide wire, and, and then the actual stent. Okay. So, uh, as I said, you know, the, uh, we, we want to get a good idea of the culprit. And so here's the guide wire, that high-performance floppy tip wire, the dark portion of that's really floppy and very friendly to the artery. We see the guide wire in position. Dr. Jamelli and the team have advanced that very nicely through the artery without any hang-ups or complications. And all of a sudden, now you see a very uh, severe blockage in the sort of the 11 o'clock position. That's the artery that's going up and down. Now, these arteries look like spider legs, you know, lots of little uh, tributaries and so forth. But that, um, there's a blockage there. Now, this artery happens not to be 100% closed. You should know that a lot of times we expect people to have um, uh, some blood thinners on board when they arrive, a little aspirin, a little uh, blood thinner like a heparin. Uh, a lot of times that happens, or sometimes patients just spontaneously open their artery. But nevertheless, that's a very high-risk artery of reclosure, and that needs to be opened because uh, the longer that stays that way, the higher likely it'll, it'll close and the patient won't do so well, so well. So what we're seeing here, again, is that, that what was probably completely blocked based on the fact this patient came in with an EKG suggesting acute myocardial infarction, but it may have opened, but still it's almost closed off. And now we're back into the catheterization. Right. So, so here we are. So um, if we could just pause there for a moment, what we can see here is the stent. 
Now the stent's a little metal tube, it's a, uh, and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a minute, but that stent is being deployed or placed right now, and if you can roll the video, you'll be able to see that uh, the artery, uh, it, you know, the stent's being deployed, the heart is moving, you know, it's not an easy task. And what we'd like to do is to place that stent in location what's from healthy to healthy. We want an artery that's uh, downstream from the stent that's relatively healthy to, to upstream. And uh, that, uh, that stent happens to be a little bit short, but that's the longest stent we've got. Uh, so it's very likely that this uh, patient's going to need another stent. Uh, but that stent is being deployed, and uh, that, uh, that's how we uh, inflate that. Before we move on with this patient, another question came through, which I think you'll be able to answer fairly quickly. Uh, what are the changes you see in the patient after the artery is open and blood flow is restored? Do they feel better? Patients feel better. They, uh, they re resume their um, normal kind of um, uh, feeling uh, a lot of times. Now, not all the time. Sometimes the stent, when we inflate, inflate the stent, imparts stretch to that artery. And so we wonder if that stretch causes some residual discomfort. Certainly that feeling of impending doom near universally kind of disappears. Um, not only that, we see other more objective things. We see the blood pressure improve a lot of times and we see the heart rate. But also that EKG, that critical EKG that we were, that diagnosed this, uh, we like to see that that improve back to its baseline. Great. So let's take us through the next step in terms actually of, of your putting in the stent and what it looks like in our patient. Okay. Let's go ahead and roll that. Let's go ahead and roll that. So here we are, and uh, back in the cath lab, and you know that, uh, st that stent was deployed, and uh, Dr. Jamelli is um, now taking some uh, follow-up pictures to see that that, uh, that the stent looks good. As I mentioned to you before, it had the appearance that the lesion was not quite as long uh, as um, we would. Uh, the, the lesion was a little longer than what the stent could cover, and so we want to make sure that we go from healthy to healthy. It's really really important. And so he's kind of looking at the images and making a careful assessment. At this point in time, the, really the hostile plaque, the, the plaque that's going to reclose and, and cause, uh, uh, put the patient at risk, that's been dealt with, the bulk of it. So really it's kind of a little bit of a touch-up at this point, make sure that the subsequent stent is well uh, positioned and, and, and placed. And so here comes in uh, the second stent. Uh, so the nurse is going to hand off the second stent. And these stents have a, a, a variety of, uh, they're coming in a large, large variety of sizes and, sh and uh and diameters and lengths, uh, but there's also a couple of types. Uh, these, these two stents happen to be uh, drug eluding stents or drug coated stents. Uh, the former stents were bare metal stents. These did not have any drug coating built or caked onto that stent. And uh, the real risk to the patient wasn't so much in this early phase, but it was later because it would be a risk of gradual renarrowing. These newer stents have become very revolutionary in how we manage these patients. Uh, these newer stents have reduced that risk of gradual renarrowing that can happen in six months to a year uh, very significantly. So it's, uh, it's been a big change in how we've practiced it. And the newer stents actually keep the inflammation from occurring and actually keep that open. Is there any downside to a new, the newer stents? There's not, the, the downside of the newer stents, the one downside is, is that you need to take a blood thinner called Plavix or Clopidogrel or a similar kind of blood thinner, there's a couple of newer ones, um, uh, for a period of a, a minimum of a year. Now, in patients who present with heart attacks, we kind of expect them to be on a year of that medicine anyways. The uh, arteries, we all know, the, even the arteries that would appear to be normal by the angiogram have plaques associated with them. These plaques are irritable. They have a lot of inflammation surrounding them, and it's been uh, the, the current guidelines would suggest that we keep the Plavix going for a full year anyways. So in a patient who can tolerate Plavix or a blood thinner where we don't know of any specific active bleeding risk or bleeding issues, uh, it seems uh, prudent to put in drug eluting stents uh, in patients. But there are situations where drug eluting stents aren't needed. For example, large arteries, uh, those arteries uh, tend not to develop that gradual renarrowing over time, and it's quite acceptable in those cases to put in uh, uh, non-drug eluting or bare metal stents. And we've talked a fair amount about stents. Uh, Brenda Larson, our chest pain coordinator, is here to, to, to show us what a stent looks like and maybe have us look at an animation. Brenda, what's a stent? Well, as, as Amish had kind of talked about, a stent is a very thin metal uh, tube that's a, sort of a meshwork of metal 
uh, is crimped down very tight on a balloon. I have an example here uh, that's showing uh, the stent. It's mounted tight down on a balloon, and this balloon then is inserted. Let's see if we can zoom in on your hand there. There we go. Okay. And as Amish had said, they come in various lengths and thicknesses, all very, very small. Uh, this is uh, 28 millimeters in length here, just to give you an idea of the size of this stent. And so, that's before it's been blown mm -hmm. up, right? That exactly. That is what's fit into across that blockage before the balloon blows up and the stent expands. That is, that is right? correct. It goes in over the wire, that very, very thin, fl uh, flimsy wire that's already down the coronary artery. And then as you saw previously on that last footage, there was a, a, a dial-type device that was used to inflate the balloon. We call it an inflation device. And uh, once this is positioned angiographically uh, and using x-rays, so it's appropriately positioned in the artery, they go ahead and use that inflation device to blow up the balloon. Once the balloon is blown up, uh, then the stent opens up and it stays in place. The balloon is then deflated and removed from the artery. Uh, I think we have an animation here that we could kind of roll just to sort of yeah. graphically show what happens inside when a stent is deployed. As you can see here, the balloon is now being inflated. That stent then opens up, stays in place. The balloon is then deflated and snaked back out of the artery. And all that calcium and lipid and, and, and clot is pushed out of the way and the blood vessel is left open. That's in the perfect situation. Let's go back to our patient and see how the patient's doing in the next video. And Amish, why don't you take us through this one? So let's go start that video. And, uh, you know, as I said, uh, there appeared that uh, there was a kind of a step uh, up. It's not um, maybe apparent for those who aren't used to looking at these angiograms, but there is a, a change there at the, <coughs> the, really the uh, front end of that stent. We knew it wasn't quite long enough. And so we're now taking pictures to see uh, specifically uh, where the uh, change is. You can sort of see that through the middle. It's, again, it's a little tricky. Uh, there, but uh, it's really important, uh, Rick, to make sure that the stent is wide, widely open, to make sure that the lumen <coughs> is, import, is open, and that the stent struts or the scaffolding is placed right up against the wall of the artery. Um, th those are the real key sort of uh, angioplasty techniques, the sort of the, the tried and true techniques that we've known for years to be quite effective in preventing those stents from reclosing. Yeah, that's that's. A beautiful graphic there. And we have another question, and I think actually will tie in to what I know is our next video as well. And this is about whether there can ever be problems. We're showing a best case scenario, or, or so far anyway. And the question is, do catheters or stents ever dislodge a clot or cause an embolism during a procedure? And why don't you expand on what are the risks that we need to tell a patient about that can occur when we do this invasive procedure in the throes of myocardial infarction? Well, there's a, you know, when we're trying to counsel patients, of course, we're trying to do this very quickly. We're working alongside, and essentially what I tell patients is, look, you know, you have a small risk of a blood clot forming on a catheter, and that catheter going up, potentially causing a stroke, potentially going downstream into the artery or distal to the artery, and blocking off a blood vessel or another blood vessel. Or you could die from those, that, either of those um, problems. Uh, but the the risk of that happening far is, is far lower than the, the benefit of opening up the arteries. There's so much more benefit in getting that artery open. And when people hear it that way, they sort of get it, and they're, and they're willing to have the procedure. That said, there are other complications that can happen that are more related to the actual deployment of the stent. Now, when a stent is deployed, again, it, the idea is that you're pushing the plaque and the clot up against the side wall of the artery, but this is a mesh. This is not a you know, op uh, closed tube. It's an open, slotted tube. And some of that, uh, that clot or gruel, if you will, will sneak in back in through the lumen. Is that a medical term, gruel? It's a gruel. <laughs> and uh, cause uh, some of that uh, de debris, if you will, yeah. will go down the artery and plug up the microvasculature. Uh, that's a complication that uh, we refer to as a no reflow or slow reflow. So even if you open up the vessel, suddenly there's not blood flow. And that gives us an opportunity to queue up this next video. And why don't you take us through what we're seeing in this still shot. So the second stent was subsequently deployed. Uh, and unfortunately, that problem of slow reflow happened. It's 
oftentimes difficult to predict. People have tried to develop prediction tools to try to identify when this might occur. But it's really important to emphasize the fact that you want to be in a place that knows how to deal with this right away. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really a graphic picture, isn't it? And it must, you must feel crestfallen when you see that after opening up the vessel and actually suddenly yeah. the blood isn't flowing after all. I'm sure you have tricks, if you will, to, uh, to make an attempt to open up this vessel and restore the blood flow. And what do you think is happening when you see that, that no-flow phenomenon? Well, I think early on in my training, you know, when I saw something like that, my heart would beat a little faster, probably faster than the patient. But now, after seeing this, knowing what to do, many years of doing this, it's become reflexive. The uh, treatment of this condition is usually the local administration or intracoronary administration of uh, drugs that can open up those microchannels, those microvessels that are plugged up as a result of the debris that was sent. Is that out. what you did in this case? That was what was done. Dr. And now Jerome. the next video, I think, will show us the result. Right. So if we can cue that one up, and you can see that really within a few wow. seconds of administration of this agent, the artery is now wide open, the stents are in an excellent position, and uh, there's a, a good amount of blood flow, normal amount of blood flow to that artery. Now, the artery is not normal, and as you might imagine, there's some lumps and bumps here. That patient's really got to start working on their cholesterol and their risk factors. But this is, this is good for now. And uh, that patient, uh, this patient is likely to do well. And would, would feel better there. We have another question come in for uh, Dr. Wubin. Uh, it it re reflects the question of, of how you interact with other EMS services. How do they respond to you? And are you working with all paramedic uh, level services? Oh, well, certainly not. The rural nature of Wisconsin is such that uh, many of the services that we're uh, interacting with quite regularly are basic or intermediate or IV tech level uh, EMS services. Uh, a basic EMT is your typical volunteer uh, EMT or emergency medical technician who's working in the rural areas. Many of those areas have also paramedic backup. Uh, and frequently, as we've alluded to, one of the things that we're doing quite frequently now is we're actually going out to the scene uh, where these um, STEMIs or heart attacks have been diagnosed. Um, we have a, a very good working relationship with these uh, services, um, and uh, we interact with them 365 days of the year. And uh, we try and provide appropriate feedback in terms of uh, the good cases, the cases uh, where um, uh, uh, we, things didn't go as well and things like that. So we try to, to very much give feedback and, and have an open dialogue with the services that we interact that with. That must be very gratifying for the people in the field. For one thing, it must be like the helicopter landing is, is like the cavalry arriving if, if you've got a very sick patient. And, and in fact, you're doubling the medical um, coverage in that case, if it's just one doctor or certainly a paramedic or, or EMT, to have you and your team arrive must be amazing. But, but likewise, to have the follow-up is so important so they can know how things went or maybe even improve their service locally or know how best to work with you. What's the response been as you've followed up with these individuals? Oh, they universally are interested to know what happened. It's just a basic intrinsic nature of the people who go into this field. And also to, alluding to what you were saying is that uh, our job sometimes is easy compared to being a, a basic EMT or a paramedic out in the field, sometimes a long way from any backup. So uh, that, in my mind, is almost a harder job than what we do. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it takes skill at all levels, and I think it's wonderful the way you're interacting with them. Let's go back to our patient for, for a minute and, and cue up the next video where you've done your job, Amish, but now you've got a, a tube that's in the <laughs> groin, and, um, and you don't want to leave that in the patient. You left the stent, and that's where it belongs. Take us through uh, this, this next uh, picture or two. Okay, so here we are. We're taking some final shots here. You know, um, before we get to the groin, you'll see that in a minute, you know, we just want to reemphasize what um, Ryan was saying. You know, in the field, the uh, EMTs and EMS and paramedics are doing a, have to do a phenomenal job. So, so the catheter's coming the catheter out. out there. Okay. Yeah, so the catheter's coming out, and you're going to see uh, the, the groin here in a minute. But, you know, they, uh, they have to do an EKG in the field, and, a, and it's a very challenging thing that EKG gets transmitted directly to my BlackBerry. So it's an amazing thing of technology. The, um, 
Uh, and in a moment, you'll see the groin shot uh, coming up. Now, what does that mean, a groin shot? Well, we have a tube sitting in the femoral artery in the leg, and that tube has to come out, as you said. And we have to do that safely, but at the same time, we want patients to be able to recover quickly. In the old days, we used to put a big clamp, and that clamp used to sit on that artery for a long period of time. Uh, these patients are, are anticoagulated or have very powerful blood thinners on board, as you might imagine. And, uh, but nowadays, a variety of tools or devices have been developed to, to seal the artery, the hole of the artery. What we're seeing here is an artery, uh, an angiogram of the artery in the leg. You can kind of see the, the outline of the hip bone there, and you can see the, the rest of it's the pelvis. But the contrast is injected into the artery, and, uh, and uh, that tube is, is in a good and a favorable position to deploy one of these devices that can uh, take the, the, take the, um, be able to take that artery, that sheath out and uh, seal the artery so that that patient can uh, minimize the amount of time spent on their back before they can get up and walk around. Great. We've got another question for Dr. Wubin, um, I think uh, from an EMT who's watching this evening. Uh, it says, as an EMT, is there anything to be looking for in a patient who has had a stent in the past? And can the stent move? And is there anything we can do to comfort the patient at that point, maybe when they're waiting for you to fly in and help out? Well, the thing that uh, also for my emergency medicine practice is that if you've already had one stent, uh, the potential for that, and Dr. Raval can probably talk more about that, is that the, uh, the chance for developing either more uh, coronary disease and those lumps and bumps that we're seeing on the angiogram further down in the future if lipids are not controlled and, and blood pressures aren't watched can also turn into uh, problems further down the line. So for the uh, EMT who uh, encounters a patient, not so much, I guess I'm not so much worried about the stent itself moving, but the fact that there could be further development of coronary disease uh, further down the line that would need, that could be another heart attack. So. Right. They don't always last forever. So chances are if someone has had a stent before, they're, they're having the real deal this time as well. Yeah. Um, maybe for all of you, a uh, question comes in asking, besides aspirin and nitroglycerin, what are some other medications that are utilized during a STEMI in the pre-hospital field or at the hospital or maybe even at, at, at home? Well, I'd actually like to kind of talk about the pre-hospital and Great. at the home. Uh, yes, of course, medications are critical at, at, at time of recognition of STEMIs, but even more so is that actual recognition is that it's acquiring that 12 lead EKG, uh, reassuring the patient that they did the right thing by calling the EMS services because that is the front door for getting this process going. They can acquire that 12 lead EKG, either read it, paramedics can interpret that 12 lead and call MedFlight directly, or call uh, the, the closest hospital to activate this process of treating the patient at a PCI hospital. Uh, they can transmit the ECG, like to Dr. Ravel's BlackBerry. Uh, they can get this process going. Yes, getting the medications on board is essential, but also mobilizing that patient as quickly as possible and not delaying time on the ground. I think you raised a very important point, and that is there's no embarrassment to coming into the emergency room and saying, I, may ha I feel unwell, I may have chest pain, or as, you, as was mentioned earlier in women, they may not even feel chest pain when they're having a heart attack in half the cases. Mm -hmm. So if you feel profoundly unwell all of a sudden and you're short of breath and you're sweating, as a, I used to work in emergency rooms and I would be often relieved if there wasn't chest pain causing a heart attack. And likewise, we can quickly identify whether there is a heart attack going on and then escalate to inviting Dr. Wubin and Dr. Raval to join the group or reassure the patient. But if the patient waits, what happens if they wait? If they wait, uh, serious complications can happen. Their heart can stop or even worse so. Uh, the family members can drive their loved ones to the hospital. We know that 50% of the population tries to transport themselves directly or family drives them into the emergency department. And that's fine and, 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 and said, but if something critical happens, they are out of luck. They don't have Dr. Wubin there with the paddles to shock or them Or EMS with a defibrillator, right. exactly, exactly. Perfect. And we are not recognized that STEMI or heart attack until they actually present to an, an ED. And the other thing is, mentioning again, time is muscle. Mm -hmm. If the patient waits, I, I've had the heartbreaking feeling when I've seen a patient in the emergency room who waited six hours with chest pain and didn't want to trouble someone or thought it might be nothing, 
And then after six hours, we might open up the vessel, but the blood, the, the heart that was receiving that blood or should have been receiving that blood, it's gone at that point, and the patient has significant scarring to the heart. Rick, you know that 30% of people will die after 24 hours of the onset of chest pain. Half of those people will die before they ever see medical attention at a hospital. Wow. So it's really important, you know, we can't stress it enough to get the patient in. You know, Brenda's uh, done a very great, terrific job at our institution of putting together the uh, STEMI protocol so that regional providers have a very unified um, approach, standard approach to the pre-hospital uh, use of, to the pre-PCI hospital use of medications. And that includes aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, there's Plavix, that's 600 milligrams, very standard dose, and intravenous heparin. This is what we want to see on all the patients before they arrive to our facility. Speaking of aspirin, if you're at home and someone's having a heart attack, I've heard that chewing on an aspirin if they're having chest pain at home might be a good idea. Do you advocate that? Absolutely. You know, if, if they have it in their hand or within reach, that's when you should take it. Ideally, you want to take at least 162 milligrams. That's two baby aspirins or a full aspirin, a 325. But that's only if it's within reach. We don't want people going to the local pharmacy to go pick up the aspirin or going across right. the street to the neighbors. We don't. We, that's not the point. The local EMT, the paramedics, they'll have aspirin. They're going to get that on board. Um, so really uh, can reiterate enough, time is of the essence, and getting that 911 call is really Speaking important. of time being of the essence, I think we still have a patient on the cath lab table. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so let's, let's move on to the <clears throat> final video of the heart catheterization that was, was uh, performed, basically closing up and getting the patient ready to go back up to a hospital room. Let's cue that video, please. So here we are. We've taken a, a, a picture of the groin to make sure that uh, a closure device would be suitable. There's certain technical reasons why we can't put closure devices sometimes. But here it is. This is a typical closure device. This is called an angioseal. It's a very commonly per, uh, performed uh, uh, closure. Um, the, uh, the artery is recannulated. With the, the, the original straw is taken out, and this is put back in. We make sure it's in the right position by some of that blood coming back, you can see. And now comes the sealing, sealant deployant um, mechanism. And once that's in, you know, we're, we're pretty much done with the patient. But we, Can the patient we, get up and walk around at that moment? Can't, can't walk, up, walk around. We get them up to the ICU, and we have them recover. The nurse is there. But what's fundamentally important here is we make sure that the loop is closed with the whole team. This is Dr. Jamelli on the phone with the referring ED physician um, telling them about the result, telling them about you know, the, the job that was done, the timings, any quality improvement that could have been done, you know, we discuss. Um, but most of the time, you know, it's just kind of pat on the back. That's perfect. So giving the feedback directly to the physician and the referring um, cardiologist or emergency room or whatever to give them that feedback show our appreciation, congratulate them on right. the job that they did as part of this whole cascade. And then after this, the patients go back and are generally cared for locally, aren't they? Yeah, so once they you know, pass, their, they're, they're in the ICU for a day, they're on the wards for a couple of days, so standard is three days in hospital. Then they, we expect them you know, to recover well, expect them to enter a cardiac rehabilitation program, great evidence to show that that improves their long-term outcomes. And that can be done very locally, exactly. Uh, we, we tie them with cardiologists locally and their internists and make sure that they're on the, the appropriate medications to prevent this all from happening again. Great. Perfect. I have a, a, a really uh, interesting question here, and, and that is of the panel, what kind of training did you have to go through to be a part of this team? And let's start with you, Brenda. Uh, well, my training, uh, basically, most of my training has been as a cath lab nurse. So uh, moving into the coordinator role, the, the, the biggest light bulb that went off for me was to actually see the entire process from beginning to end. I had grown up as a nurse in the cath lab and really saw my part of treating STEMI patients as just my door to balloon from the cath lab. But as a coordinator, I'm appreciating every aspect from the patient and what they did to the EMS services, to the med flight, to closing the loop with the regional facilities and our local ED department, and sort of seeing that the whole process went um, according to plan. And I had great mentors, who Chris Griffin, who is my boss, and the person in front of me who helped me in 
learn this role and my physician support staff. So that's basically how I learned Great. on the so job. You came from the aspect of being a nurse in the yes. cath lab and now you're coordinating the whole system. Yes. Great. Dr. Wubin, how about yourself? How did you end up being an emergency physician flying helicopters? Uh, my background is, was as a basic EMT in college, uh, which then uh, when I went to medical school and then uh, uh, did all of us on uh, med flight and in the emergency department uh, did emergency medicine residency training programs of usually three or four years. Uh, most of the people who fly on med flight that I hire usually have previous flight experience of one way or another and are board certified in emergency medicine. And in the process of all of that training, you get exposed to a lot of uh, cardiac care and critical care. So I think that's, that's important to emphasize. So in our emergency room, everyone is trained in emergency medicine, which is a, a board certification specialty. Unto itself. I also find it interesting that, that you worked as a par paramedic once. An so, EMT. Uh, as an a EM basic an EMT. EMT. Even better. I was an emergency room orderly, and nothing gave me a better appreciation of, of the importance of nurses, hopefully orderlies, as well as the physicians in emergency rooms, as being part of a multidisciplinary team. We can't do it without working together. It also keeps us humble, doesn't it, having been at the the bottom of the food chain, if you will, at one point in our life, and I think that was reflected in, in the respect you have for EMTs that are out there in the we, field. Having been an EMT called out in the middle of the night, you know how that You know feels. how it feels. Great. Amish, so what for, kind of training do you go through to be a heart catheter cardiologist? Well, so the, for the privilege of doing what I do, you know, it's four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine training, three years of cardiology training, that's a general cardiology training, and in my case, I did two years of interventional cardiology training, that is advancement of uh, catheters and stents for treatment of arteries. So med school, internal medicine training, cardiology, then two years of intervention. Right. Okay. It adds up. It really does, doesn't <laughs> it? But it's fun. I, I enjoy every day going into work. Uh, I can truly say that. Uh, it's one of these fields where you get a, quite an instant reward. You know, the patient um, on the one hand has that sort of sense of impending doom, and they're very sick, very uh, high risk. And, and, and within a few minutes, you can reverse that course, that, they're, that slippery slope that they're going down, and you can reverse it uh, within an instant. And, and you're in an ever-changing field. Even, even now, in addition to putting in stents to open up arteries, there's talk of valves that can be put in through blood vessels to replace heart valves. And I believe University of Wisconsin is going to be on the vanguard in that area, right? Yep, very soon we're going to be uh, up and running and being able to put these uh, valves. These are valves that were traditionally being placed using surgery. That's open chest and opening the, the, the chest up and putting a new valve in, putting a patient on a heart-lung machine. It's not easy for some patients. In fact, a lot of patients are just not good candidates for that kind of surgery. Nowadays, there's a device, a valve that can be placed on a catheter, placed very similar. A pretty big catheter, isn't it? It's a lot bigger than the one we <laughs> saw on there. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's a catheter. And the point is, is that the patient doesn't have to have their chest invaded. Um, the, um, uh, the procedure is uh, you know, something that has been shown to really improve outcomes and improve survival. And, um, and it's, it's something and, we're looking for. And to. I would emphasize that this is a very exciting part of medicine and cardiology, but it's done in concert with our cardiothoracic surgeons. As a matter of fact, you can't get this device unless a surgeon has said that surgery is not an option. And at the University of Wisconsin, actually, the cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons are going to be working side by side for placement of these devices. Very interesting. Um, bringing it back to the patient. Today we've covered a lot in terms of this individual presumably having chest pain, got an EKG, flew in the helicopter, got care in the emergency uh, through in, in the cath lab, had the blood vessel is open in 46 minutes on average, uh, or at least within 90 minutes, which is outstanding, and now is doing great. But back to the beginning. Let's review the symptoms that, that might bring a patient to seeking our attention. Brenda, tell us about that. Well, of course, as, as Amish had alluded to earlier, your classic symptoms of an elephant sitting on the chest, a very heaviness in the chest. And as, we, as was mentioned earlier, women present much differently. A lot of times they're shortness of breath, nausea, sweating, very profusely sweating. Uh, other symptoms would be dizziness, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, pain in the jaw, upper back, upper chest, 
radiating to both arms or one arm alone or even just heaviness in the arms. Am I missing any other symptoms that you can think of? No, as I said, you know, I mentioned earlier with people with diabetes and uh, elderly patients can present with completely uh, unusual symptoms. Uh, lightheadedness or fainting can mm -hmm. be a, a symptom. Uh, so you have to keep your mind, I think the bottom line is you have to keep your mind open. If you're feeling very unwell with a sense that something really bad is happening to you, you need to seek attention right away. Or when I talk to, to semi patients after their procedure, any time they present with something atypical, I try to reemphasize that if that symptoms happens again, to not ignore that. That could be their anginal equivalent. So don't ignore that and seek medical attention immediately. Right. And they may not know. We don't know. I can't tell someone's having a heart attack until I do what? Look at the electrocardiogram. I can have high suspicion. But the only way for any of us to be aware is to get that EKG, not waste any time, and get to the cath lab as soon as possible if they're having a myocardial infarction. I want to thank our audience online who have sent in some really good questions this evening. And I'm afraid we're about out of time. I want to thank you for, for joining us. And I'd also like to thank our panelists. Um, this has been, I think, a, a, a very valuable educational session. We clearly had a number of of sophisticated questions coming out there and some lay questions. Um, so in closing, I'm Richard Page. I'm a cardiologist. I'm chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Wisconsin. It's really been my pleasure and privilege to host this event this evening. And for Dr. Amish Raval, Dr. Ryan Wubin, and Brenda Larson, and all of us here at UW Health, I want to thank you for watching, and you have a very good night.